were talking about grace and truth, grace and truth. John chapter 1, verses 14 and verse 17, the Bible says, The Word became flesh, made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, what I want you to understand today about this is, is that the idea of him being full of grace and truth. Jesus was full, complete. He was perfect as to grace and truth. That means that there is something called absolute grace and something called absolute truth because if he's full of it, then it's absolute in its nature. Jesus did not merely know some truth. He didn't just uh, tell some truth. He did not merely express some grace or tell people about grace to be more gracious. He lacked no grace. He lacked no truth. He was full of grace and truth. He's absolute grace and truth. If this is true, there's no other place to get perfect grace and truth than Jesus. Now, again, um, this is incredibly simple. This is kind of one-on-one -on -one stuff. If Jesus is full of grace and truth, then there's nowhere else to go to get complete grace and truth than Jesus. Because I may be a little bit full of grace and truth, but I'm not yet full of grace and truth. Okay, so if you come to me for grace and truth, you're going to get as much grace and truth as I have. If you go to Jesus for grace and truth, you're going to get it all. But he, because he's full of grace and truth. This is ground zero of our faith. As Peter said in John chapter 6, verses 68, 69, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. So this authentic faith that we're looking for must be injected into each circumstance of life if we're going to realize that grace and truth has now become embodied in us. In other words, every situation you're in, including the one you're in right now, sitting here in this service right now, you have an opportunity to inject grace and truth into this service. When you leave here and you go somewhere else, or in your potluck meal, or wherever you may be, you're going to have an opportunity to inject grace and truth into that setting and that situation. So what I, want to, what I want to show you today is from John chapter 3, and I appreciate Will reading the passage to you today. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. Now. You would expect, if he was a member of the Jewish ruling council, you would expect he'd kind of have it, you know, pretty well together. He didn't know a whole bunch of truth. And maybe he didn't, it even developed a little bit of grace in his life. You know, that he'd be living victoriously in this truth. What it tells me is, is that don't take for granted anything in this area of grace and truth. Because it's not, it's, not, it's not who's in your circumstance, who steps into your circle that counts. It doesn't matter what their credentials are, their titles are, you know, anything about that. What matters is, do they get it? Do they get it or they don't get it? And I'm telling you, a lot of people who may seem to get it, don't get it. And we need some... We need some way to vet that. Jesus is going to have to kind of vet this out here with old Nicodemus. Now, this ruling council, obviously, is the highest ruling council of the Jewish nation. Okay. Verse 2, he came to Jesus at night. Why did he come to Jesus at night? And this is an important thing in this whole story because things that Jesus is going to say next has a lot to do with him coming to Jesus at night. Now, I want you to really get this because if this is contextual here. He's sneaking in at night to see Jesus. There's something about Nicodemus that says, I'm not sure I want to be seen with this guy yet. And so I'm going to sneak in here and we're going to have a conversation. And that's a very important thing. All right. And he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you're doing if God were not with him. Now, th is this a genuine statement? You see, sometimes people say things kind of on the surface, and we can take them at face value, but did he really understand what he was saying? Now, he's making a pronouncement about Jesus, 
And he's saying, well, Jesus, you know, you're obviously from God. You know, you couldn't do all these things unless God were with you. But is it true? Is it said with conviction? What if Nicodemus really believed this? What, what would follow in his life if he really believed that Jesus was the one whom God is with? It is true, but is it said with conviction again? You know, often people make truth statements without living out the implications of those truth statements. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, rights of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. You all recognize those as words of Thomas Jefferson in the preamble to the Constitution of the United States of America. Did Thomas Jefferson really believe those truths? Does he really hold these truths in his heart? Well, we can look at his life and we can say, well, I'm sure in his context, he believed those things to be absolutely true. I would say in practice, why do he have slaves? Why do he own slaves? If I told you I believe all men were created equal and then I went home and, and had, had me a slave, you know, that I owned and ordered around and told him what to do, would you think I really believe that all men are created equal? Now, again, I'm not trying to dish on Thomas Jefferson here or any of our other uh, founding fathers here, but just because you say certain things doesn't mean you got it all worked out in your life yet. You may hold certain truths and you may say certain things, but until it becomes a firm conviction in your heart and then you act upon it, that's what Jesus is looking for in the lives of people. So when it says he is full of grace and truth, it's not just that he's, he's full of all the right answers. He's living that truth out in his life. And he's trying to teach us how to live that truth out in our life. So Jesus replied, Very, tru very truly I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Now Jesus gives a truth statement here that should be the logical next step for someone who believes that he is a man sent from God, that he couldn't do these things unless God were with him. Jesus sees the contradiction in Nicodemus's life. He is, he's openly proclaiming a truth with his words, but he's coming to Jesus in secret. Now there's something wrong with this picture. Jesus is seeing that there needs to be more truth injected into this scene so that Nicodemus can get more in line with the truth. Because sneaking around in the dark is not in alignment with truth. If you truly believe something, you, you do it in the light. If, you, if, you're not, if you're aligned with Jesus, you're not afraid to be seen with it. Anywhere, anytime, any place. Nicodemus, he wasn't there yet. Now again, I'm not, I'm not trying to beat up on Nicodemus either. Thank God, he was probably one of the few of, of those folks in the ruling council that had the guts enough to even come to him at night. And so, bless his heart, he got that far, and we're going to find out he's going to go a whole lot further because when Jesus was crucified on the cross, it's Nicodemus that was taking his body down from the cross. Okay? So Nicodemus is going to get there. But there was this contradiction. How can this Pharisee see the kingdom when he is in the darkness of the wound? He needs to be born again to come into the light. Jesus is offering him grace so that he can see because he's still in the wound. His faith hasn't developed yet. It's dark in the womb, I would imagine. Before a baby is born, kind of dark in there. If you're going to come out in the light, let's get you out in the open. That's part of what conversion is all about, is for us to be born into the light so that we come out in the open. And we can say, establish myself in the light and say, I'm a Christian. That's why we confess our faith before men. That's why we are open with our lives and we say this is who I am that's part of what being born again is all about 
When I go in down into the waters of baptism, I come up out of those waters, I am proclaiming to the entire world, I am proud to be identified with Jesus Christ who, who died and was buried and was raised on the third day. And I'm not going to do anything in the secret anymore. I'm not going to do those things in the shadows anymore. And so God, Jesus was offering him grace so that he could see some things. Well, how can someone be born when he's old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born. Nick is blinded by the truth. He's not penet it, it's not penetrating into his understanding yet. He's, he's responding with his earthly mind. Not his spiritual mind, because these spiritual truths, if they're going to be understood, have to be understood spiritually. Jesus is trying to get him there, but he's not there yet. So Jesus answered, Verily I, I, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear a sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Now that's a mouthful. There's a lot in that. But Jesus felt that Nicodemus could handle some of that. And so he put that out there for him. Jesus injects unsurprisingly surprising truths. You notice he says, you shouldn't be surprised. But he was. Sometimes we're surprised at things that Jesus thinks we ought not to be surprised about. I mean, I'm surprised all the time about what people are surprised about. I mean, you tell them simple things like right and wrong. You know, you, you shouldn't do that. That's not the way to live. And they're like, really? You're surprised at me telling you you probably shouldn't live that way? It's not a good idea to do this? Wow, that's a new thing. Talk about things getting turned upside down in all which ways, okay? Often we talk to people when, when we present what should be familiar, normal speech, but they will be surprised and sometimes not pleasingly surprised. But let me tell you this. We don't change the truth to accommodate ourselves to people because they're going to be surprised that we told them the truth. It's the truth. Now, how we tell them the truth is very important because it's also full of grace. It's full of grace. It's not a judgmental way of doing it. It's just simply say, you know, there's just a right and there's a wrong, there's a true and there's a false, there's a good and there's an evil. And we have to speak that truth in there even though someone may like, whoa, I'm a little surprised you told me that. Well, Nicodemus says, how can this be? He's still struggling with the truth and the grace that, fo that follows that truth. Now, what follows in the next uh, 11 verses here, and I'm going to go through them very, pretty quickly here, what follows in the next 11 verses is some of the greatest truth statements of all time. We're not going to have time to do service to them. But as we look at these, imagine you're saying this to someone you're trying to help be saved, especially someone who should know more than they do. So let's look at these statements. Jesus says, you're a teacher. You don't understand these things? Respectfully, we have to help people admit that they need help. Sometimes if we're going to get into this business of helping, you know, sharing truth with people, we have to get them to a place where they admit they need help. What did the Ethiopian do? What, or what did Philip do with the Ethiopian in Acts chapter 8? He says, do you understand what you're reading? Now, he could have just, you know, covered it all up and said, oh, yeah, I got it covered. Yeah, I got it. And didn't understand a thing about it. He, you know, he's just like, I don't want to admit that I don't understand what I'm reading. But he was honest enough and humble enough to say, no, I really don't understand what I'm reading. Can, you know, how can I unless somebody explain it to me? We need to get people or help people get to the point where they can say, no, I really don't understand this. Can you help me? Can you help me understand it? He says, very, very, uh, very truly, I tell you, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we've seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. Now, here's something I want us to 
and I've got to put this in here somewhere. I'm not sure I put it in my notes, but I don't want to forget this. You know, when we're talking about, oh, it's, it's going to come later on, but I'll go ahead and say it now. When I am trying to establish truth in a person's life, it's not my truth. It's not about my credentials. It doesn't matter how many degrees I have after my name. It doesn't matter how long I've studied my Bible. It doesn't matter any of that because it's not my credentials that count. It's Jesus' credentials. It's his truth. He's the one who is full of grace and truth. What we're worrying people to is him who is the truth teller. Because as soon as you set yourself up as the truth teller, you know what you're going to get back? Well, who are you? Who are you to tell me what the truth is? And you know what? Don't fall into that trap. You know how you stay out of that trap? Don't tell people your truth. Tell people Jesus' is truth. And just simply say, I got somebody that knows the truth. And he wants to tell you some truth. Let's just open it up and read the book. And let's open it up and say, here's the truth. Now they can reject Jesus. They can say, I don't believe he's got the truth. I don't think he knows the truth. They can do anything they want to. But if they do, they won't be rejecting you. They'll be rejecting him. We need to be careful here not to set ourselves up as somehow those who are full of grace and truth when we're not full of grace and truth. We're maybe being filled with grace and truth by the same person that wants to fill them with grace and truth. Okay? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Jesus is establishing his truth credentials. When we tell people the truth, we do not establish our truth credentials. I knew it was in the note somewhere. Verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. He's using something that Nicodemus probably had heard about in the Old Testament. And that was the story of, of the snakes that came among them because they rebelled against God in the wilderness. Now what Jesus is subtly saying to Nicodemus is, Nicodemus, you're in a rebellious state and there's some snakes going to come against you. But instead of lifting up a bronze snake on a pole now, it's the Son of God that's going to be lifted up. And everybody who looks to the Son of God and believes in him will have eternal life. And that's the difference. He's taking something he's heard about, he knows about from the Old Testament, and he's bringing it now into the New Testament. And then that famous verse, verse 16, for God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus offers up the purpose of his being sent by God. You know, Nick has already said, I believe that you're a man come from God. Because nobody could do these things unless God were with you. He's already said that's what he believes. Now Jesus is saying, well, if you believe that, let me tell you why I came. The purpose for which I came was to express the love of God to you so that if you believe in me, you will not perish. You'll have eternal life. That's why, you came. That's why I came. So if you really believe that I was sent from God, don't you want to know why I'm here? You see how all of this goes back to the very original statement and the context of... Jesus isn't speaking out of context here. He's speaking right in the context of things. And then in verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now Jesus expands the truth by telling Nick why Jesus did not come into the world. He didn't come into the world to condemn Nicodemus. Our truth statements are not meant to condemn people. They're meant to save people. Now, if we present them in such a way that they get the impression that we're condemning them, then that's our fault. But we're to present them in such a way that people will see that we're trying to help them. That is the right thing to do. If I really love somebody, then I'm going to warn them about what it means to perish. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because... They have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Jesus explains that condemnation is something one chooses when they reject Jesus. I believe there's only one sin that will send you to hell. You may be surprised at that. Didn't Jesus die for all of our sins? He did. 
And any unrepentant sin, any unforgiven sin, I guess will send you to hell. But you know what the one sin that will send you to hell? Rejecting Jesus. When you reject Jesus, you reject the solution for all the other sins. The greatest sin is to reject Jesus. It's not to listen to Jesus. It's the one and only son that's been sent for the salvation of the world. And that's what Nick is deciding. Nicodemus is deciding of whether or not he's going to accept, accept or reject Jesus. It's grace because it's always the loving thing to do to tell people what will happen if they don't do something. And they're in black. Okay. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light. Notice, when did, you, when did Nicodemus come to him? In the darkness. Not just the physical darkness. Jesus is trying to show him that you've got more than physical darkness going on here. You've got a bigger problem than just coming to him at, at night. You've got some darkness inside, Nicodemus, that you need to come out of. I mean, is he offending this guy? This is a religious ruler of the people of Israel. Jesus is no respecter of persons. All men are created equal in Jesus' heart. He knows that because he created them. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes to the light so that they may, so it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. You know what Nick, Nicodemus needed more than anything? He needed to step out of the shadows and get into the light. And that's exactly what he was being told by Jesus, the truth. But you know what? That's the most gracious thing you can tell anybody. It's a whole lot better in the light. It is so good in the light. The darkness, things breed in the darkness. Things get healed in the light. Things get taken care of in the light. Things get forgiven in the light. Come on, Nicodemus, step out of that darkness and get into the light. And then, when that happens, it will be seen plainly that whatever you do from now on, it will be done in the sight of God. How many times... In the scriptures that we have this phrase, in the sight of God, in the sight of God. Everything's in the sight of God, even the things in the darkness. He knows everything. Nothing can be hidden from his eyes. However, he wants us to step out in the shadows. And he wants us to live in the way that he knows is already true. I'm seeing everything anyway. He, Jesus is bringing it home. It's based on the fact that Nick is sneaking around in the darkness. People live in the darkness because they're afraid of something. You know what he was afraid of? The same thing everybody else was afraid of. They don't want to be exposed. I'm telling you, us human beings have gotten very good at not being exposed. We can hide anything, at least for a while. But the things that are done in the darkness will one day be revealed. They'll all be exposed by the light. When Jesus comes again, that's why there's no night in heaven. You know the lights never go off in heaven? Why? Everything's exposed in heaven. Everything is in the light in heaven. Jesus brilliantly spoke truth and grace into this circumstance. He saw Nick for who he was. He loved him enough to tell him the truth. He masterfully introduced truths and themes to Nick that could change his life if he would simply embrace them. Jesus did not respond in fear or intimidation or in anxiety or nervousness. He didn't fear possible conflict with Nicodemus. He was calm. He was straightforward. He was focused. He is teaching us how to do the same thing. The circumstances of our lives are begging for some grace and truth. Something very much lacking in many of our conversations today. Now, Jesus is the one who can teach all of us how to do this. So I want to end with this. It's the vision of the Central Church of Christ to help people have an authentic and growing relationship with God the Father through His Son, Jesus. 
This is what Jesus was doing with Nicodemus. Jesus wanted to take this misguided, fearful, hypocritical, stagnant, going nowhere person, turn him into a born again person. A person who's coming into the light and a person who can walk with his head held high knowing that God is loved by God and that he's no longer under condemnation and now he can live in freedom. Freedom. People who are in the darkness are the most enslaved people in this world. Most enslaved people in this world. If we want to help people, we got to say, come on out. Come on out. Get into the light. Let Jesus shine on you. Rise from the dead. It's dark in the tomb. It was bright in the resurrection. So if we can help you today, if we can help you learn how to be in the light by sharing you with you what Jesus says, then that's why we're here.